Discordy, The We Free Men By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 4x14 That's nice, dear, said the woman, and hurried away. That wasn't very funny, said the toad from her apron. People don't listen anyway, said Tiffany. She sat down under a tree and took the toad out of her pocket. The feagles tried to steal some of our eggs and one of our sheep, she said. But I got them back. You got something back from the NAC Mac Feagle, said the toad. Were they ill? No. They were a bit. Well, sweet, actually. They even did the chores for me. The Feagle did chores, said the toad. They never do chores. They're not helpful at all. And then there was the headless horseman, said Tiffany. He had no head. Well, that is the major job qualification, said the toad. What's going on, toad, said Tiffany. Is it the feagles who are invading? The toad looked a bit shifty. Miss Tick doesn't really want you to handle this, it said. She'll be back soon with help. Is she going to be in time? Tiffany demanded. I don't know. Probably. But you shouldn't I want to know what is happening. She's gone to get some other witches, said the toad. Uh. She doesn't think you should you'd better tell me what you know, toad, said Tiffany. Miss Tick isn't here. I am. Another world is colliding with this one, said the toad. There. Happy now? That's what Miss Tick thinks. But it's happening faster than she expected. All the monsters are coming back. Why? There's no one to stop them. There was silence for a moment. There's me, said Tiffany. Chapter 4 The We Free Men Nothing Happened on the Way Back to the Farm The sky stayed blue. None of the sheep in the home paddocks appeared to be traveling backwards very fast, and an air of hot emptiness lay over everything. Ratbag was on the path leading up to the back door, and he had something trapped in his paws. As soon as he saw Tiffany he picked it up and exited around the corner of the house at high speed, legs spinning in the high-speed slink of a guilty cat. Tiffany was too good a shot with a clod of earth but at least there wasn't something red and blue in his mouth. Look at him, she said. Great cowardly blob. I really wish I could stop him catching baby birds, it's so sad. You haven't got a hat you can wear, have you, said the toad, from her apron pocket. I hate not being able to see. They went into the dairy, which Tiffany normally had to herself for most of the day. In the bushes by the door there was a muffled conversation. It went like this. What did the wee hag say? She said she wants yon cat to stop scraffin' the pewter wee buddies. Is that a... Crivens. Ne problemo. Tiffany put the toad on the table as carefully as possible. What do you eat? She said. It was polite to offer guests food, she knew. I've got used to slugs and worms and stuff, said the toad. It wasn't easy. Don't worry if you don't have any. I expect you weren't expecting a toad to drop in. How about some milk? You're very kind. Tiffany fetched some, and poured it into a saucer. She watched while the toad crawled in. Were you a handsome prince? she asked. Yeah, right. Maybe, said the toad, dribbling milk. So why did Miss Tick put a spell on you? Her. Hey, she couldn't do that, said the toad. It's serious magic, turning someone into a toad but leaving them thinking they're human. No, it was a fairy godmother. Never cross a woman with a star on a stick, young lady. They've got a mean streak. Why did she do it? The toad looked embarrassed. I don't know, it said. It's all a bit... foggy. 
I just know I've been a person. At least, I think I know. It gives me the willies. Sometimes I wake up in the night and I think, was I ever really human? Or was I just a toad that got on her nerves and she made me think I was human once? That'd be a real torture, right? Supposing there's nothing for me to turn back into. The toad turned worried yellow eyes on her. After all, it can't be very hard to mess with a toad's head, yet? It must be much simpler that turning, oh, a 160 pound human into 8 ounces of toad, yes? After all, where's the rest of the mass going to go, I asked myself? Is it just sort of, you know, left over? Very worrying. I mean, I've got one or two memories of being a human, of course, but what's a memory? Just a thought in your brain. You can't be sure it's real. Honestly, on nights when I've eaten a bad slug I wake up screaming, except all that comes out is a croak. Thank you for the milk, it was very nice. Tiffany stared in silence at the toad. You know, she said, magic is a lot more complicated than I thought. Flappity flappity flap. Cheap, cheap. A-C-H, poor wee me, cheapity cheap. Tiffany ran over to the window. There was a fegal on the path. It had made itself some crude wings out of a piece of rag, and a kind of beaky cap out of straw and was wobbling around in a circle like a wounded bird. A-C-H, cheapity cheap. Fluttery flutter. I certainly hope dear snow a pussycat around. A-C-H, dearie me, it yelled. And down the path rat bag, arch enemy of all baby birds, slunk closer, dribbling. As Tiffany opened her mouth to yell, he leaped and landed with all four feet on the little man or at least where the little man had been, because he had somersaulted in midair and was now right in front of Ratbag's face and had grabbed a cat ear with each hand. A-C-H, see you, pussycat, scunner that y-r, he yelled. Here's a gifty from the tea wee buddies, Yaskami. He butted the cat hard on the nose. Ratbag spun in the air and landed on his back with his eyes crossed. He squinted in cold terror as the little man leaned down at him and shouted, Cheap. Then he levitated in the way that cats do and became a ginger streak, rocketing down the path, through the open door and shooting past Tiffany to hide under the sink. The fegal looked up, grinning, and saw Tiffany. Please don't go she began quickly, but he went, in a blur. Tiffany's mother was hurrying down the path. Tiffany picked up the toad and put it back in her apron pocket just in time. Where's Wentworth? Is he here? Her mother asked urgently. Did he come back? Answer me. Didn't he go up to the shearing with you, Mum? said Tiffany, suddenly nervous. She could feel the panic pouring off her mother like smoke. We can't find him. There was a wild look in her mother's eyes. I only turned my back for a minute. Are you sure you haven't seen him? But he couldn't come all the way back here go and look in the house. Go on. M.R.S. Aching hurried away. Hastily, Tiffany put the toad on the floor and chivvied him under the sink. She heard him croak and ratbag, mad with fear and bewilderment, came out from under the sink in a whirl of legs and rocketed out of the door. She stood up. Her first, shameful thought was. He wanted to go up to watch the shearing. How could he get lost? He went with Mum and Hannah and Fastidia. And how closely would Fastidia and Hannah watch him with all those young men up there? She tried to pretend she hadn't thought that, but she was treacherously good at spotting when she was lying. That's the trouble with a brain. It thinks more than you sometimes want it to but he's never interested in moving far away from people. It's half a mile up to the shearing pens. And he doesn't move that fast. 
After a few feet he flops down and demands sweets. But it would be a bit more peaceful around here if he did get lost. There it went again, a nasty, shameful thought which she tried to drown out by getting busy. But first she took some sweets out of the jar as bait and rustled the bag as she ran from room to room. She heard boots in the yard as some of the men came down from the shearing sheds, but got on with looking under beds and in cupboards, even ones so high that a toddler couldn't possibly reach them, and then looked again under beds that she'd already looked under, because it was that kind of search. It was the kind of search where you go and look in the attic, even though the door is always locked. After a few minutes there were two or three voices outside, calling for Wentworth and she heard her father say, try down by the river. And that meant he was frantic too, because Wentworth would never walk that far without a bribe. He was not a child who was happy away from sweets. It's your fault. The thought felt like a piece of ice in her mind. It's your fault because you didn't love him very much. He turned up and you weren't the youngest anymore, and you had to have him trailing around after you and you kept wishing, didn't you, that he'd go away. That's not true. Tiffany whispered to herself. I quite liked him. Not very much, admittedly. Not all the time. He didn't know how to play properly, and he never did what he was told. You thought it would be better if he did get lost. Anyway, she added in her head. You can't love people all the time when they have a permanently runny nose. And anyway. I wonder. I wish I could find my brother, she said aloud. This seemed to have no effect. But the house was full of people opening and shutting doors and calling out and getting in one another's way, and they. Fiegels were shy, despite many of them having faces like a hat full of knuckles. Don't wish. Miss Tick had said. Do things. She went downstairs. Even some of the women who'd been packing fleeces up at the shearing had come down. They were clustered around her mother, who was sitting at the table, crying. No one noticed Tiffany. That often happened. She slipped into the dairy, closed the door carefully behind her, and leaned down to peer under the sink. The door burst open again and her father ran in. He stopped. Tiffany looked up guiltily. He can't be under there, girl, her father said. Well, er. Said Tiffany. Did you look upstairs? Even the attic, dad well her father looked panicky and impatient at the same time. Go and. Do something. Yes, dad. When the door had shut Tiffany peered under the sink again. Are you there, Toad? Very poor pickings under here, the Toad answered, crawling out. You keep it very clean. Not even a spider. This is urgent, snapped Tiffany. My little brother has gone missing. In broad daylight. Up on the downs, where you can see for miles. Oh, Crope said the toad. Pardon, said Tiffany. E.R., that was, E.R., swearing in toad, said the toad. Sorry, but has what's going on got something to do with magic, said Tiffany. It has, hasn't it? I hope it hasn't, said the toad, but I think it has. Have those little men stolen Wentworth? Who, the Feagles? They don't steal children. There was something in the way the toad said it. They don't steal. Do you know who has taken my brother, then? Tiffany demanded. No. But. They might, said the toad. Look, Miss Tick told me that you were not to my brother has been stolen, said Tiffany sharply. Are you going to tell me not to do anything about it? No but good. Where are the feagles now? Lying low, I expect. The place is full of people searching, after all, 
but how can I bring them back? I need them. Um, Miss Tick said how can I bring them back? Er. You want to bring them back, then, said the toad, looking mournful. Yes. It's just that's something not many people have ever wanted to do, said the toad. They're not like brownies. If you get N.A.C. Mac Fiegels in the house, it's usually best to move away. He sighed. Tell me, is your father a drinking man? He has a beer sometimes, said Tiffany. What's that got to do with anything? Only beer. Well, I'm not supposed to know about what my father calls the special sheep liniment, said Tiffany. Granny Aching used to make it in the old cow sheet. Strong stuff, is it? It dissolves spoons, said Tiffany. It's for special occasions. Father says it's not for women because it puts hairs on your chest. Then if you want to be sure of finding the NAC Mac Fiegels, go and fetch some, said the toad. It will work, believe me. Five minutes later Tiffany was ready. Few things are hidden from a quiet child with good eyesight, and she knew where the bottles were stored and she had one now. The cork was hammered in over a piece of rag, but it was old and she was able to lever it out with the tip of a knife. The fumes made her eyes water. She went to pour some of the golden brown liquid into a saucer no. We'll be trampled to death if you do that, said the toad. Just leave the cork off. Fumes rose from the top of the bottle, wavering like the air over rocks on a hot day. She felt it. A sensation, in the dim, cool room, of riveted attention. She sat down on a milking stool and said, All right, you can come out now. There were hundreds. They rose up from behind buckets. They lowered themselves on string from the ceiling beams. They sidled sheepishly from behind the cheese racks. They crept out from under the sink. They came out of places where you'd think a man with hair like an orange gone nova couldn't possibly hide. They were all about six inches tall and mostly colored blue, although it was hard to know if that was the actual color of their skins or just the dye from their tattoos, which covered every inch that wasn't covered with red hair. They wore short kilts, and some wore other bits of clothing too, like skinny waistcoats. A few of them wore rabbit or rat skulls on their heads, as a sort of helmet. And every single one of them carried, slung across his back, a sword nearly as big as he was. However, what Tiffany noticed more than anything else was that they were scared of her. Mostly they were looking at their own feet which was no errand for the faint-hearted because their feet were large, dirty, and half tied up with animal skins to make very bad shoes. None of them wanted to look her in the eye. You were the people who filled the water buckets, she said. There was a lot of foot shuffling and coughing and a chorus of eyes. And the wood box. There were more eyes. Tiffany glared at them. And what about the sheep? This time they all looked down. Why did you steal the sheep? There was a lot of muttering and nudging and then one of the tiny men removed his rabbit skull helmet and twiddled it nervously in his hands. We was hung Aaron, mistress, he muttered. But when we kenned it was thine, we did put the beastie back in the fold. They looked so crestfallen that Tiffany took pity on them. I expect you wouldn't have stolen it if you weren't so hungry. Then, she said. There were several hundred astonished looks. Oh, we would, mistress, said the helmet twiddler. You would. Tiffany sounded so surprised that the twiddler looked around at his colleagues for support. They all nodded. Yes, mistress. We have to. We are a famously stealing folk. Aren't we, lads? What's it we're famous for? Stealin', shouted the blue men. And what else, lads? Fightin'. And what else? Drinkin'. And what else? There was a certain amount of thought about this, 
but they all reached the same conclusion. Drinkin' and fightin'. And there was summit else, muttered the twiddler. A.C.H., yes. Tell the hag, lads. Stealin' and drinkin' and fightin', shouted the blue men cheerfully. Tell the wee hag who we are, lads, said the helmet twiddler. There was the scrape of many small swords being drawn and thrust into the air. N.A.C. MacFeagle. The wee free men. Nay king. Nay quinn. Nay laird. Nay master. We will na befold again. Tiffany stared at them. They were all watching her to see what she was going to do next, and the longer she said nothing, the more worried they became. They lowered their swords, looking embarrassed. But we wouldna dare deny a powerful hag, except mebby for strong drink, said the twiddler, his helmet spinning desperately in his hands and his eyes on the bottle of special sheep liniment. Will ye no help us? Help you, said Tiffany. I want you to help me. Someone has taken my brother in broad daylight. Oh Whaley, Whaley Whaley, said the helmet twiddler. She's come, then. She's come Afa Chin. We're too late. It's the Quinn. There was only one of them, said Tiffany. They mean the Queen, said the Toad. The Queen of the Hushier Gob, shouted the helmet twiddler, but his voice was lost in the wails and groans of the NAC Mac Feagles. They were pulling at their hair and stamping on the ground and shouting alackaday, and waily waily waily, and the Toad was arguing with the helmet twiddler and everyone was getting louder to make themselves heard Tiffany stood up. Everybody shut up right now, she said. Silence fell, except for a few sniffs and faint wailies from the back. We was only dreeing our weird, mistress, said the helmet twiddler, almost crouching in fear. But not in here, snapped Tiffany, shaking with anger. This is a dairy. I have to keep it clean. E.R. Dreeing your weird means facing your fate said the toad. Cause if the quin is here then it means our Kelda is weak and fast, said the helmet twiddler. And will ha Nayante look after us? To look after us, thought Tiffany. Hundreds of tough little men who could each win the worst broken nose contest need someone to look after them? She took a deep breath. My mother's in the house crying, she said, and... I don't know how to comfort her, she added to herself. I'm no good at this sort of thing, I never know what I should be saying. Out loud she said. And she wants him back. E.R. A lot. She added, hating to say it. He's her favorite. She pointed to the helmet twiddler, who backed away. First of all, she said. I can't keep thinking of you as the helmet twiddler, so what is your name? A gasp went up from the NAC Mac Feagles, and Tiffany heard one of them murmur, I, she's the hag, sure enough. That's a hag's question. The helmet twiddler looked around at them as if seeking help. We didn't give our names, he muttered. But another Feagle, somewhere safe at the back, said, Weast. You can't refuse a hag. The little man looked up, very worried. I'm the big man o' the clan, mistress, he said. And my name it is. He swallowed, rob anybody fegal, mistress. But I beg ye not to use it age in me. The toad was ready for this. They think names have magic in them, he murmured. They don't tell them to people in case they are written down. I, and put upon complicated documents, said a feagle. And summonses and such things, said another. Or wanted posters, said another. I, and bills and affidavits, said another. Writs of D.I.S. arraignment, even. The feagles looked around in panic at the very thought of written down things. They think written words are even more powerful, 
whispered the toad. They think all writing is magic. Words worry them. See their swords? They glow blue in the presence of lawyers. All right, said Tiffany. We're getting somewhere. I promise not to write his name down. Now tell me about this queen who's taken Wentworth. Queen of what? Canna say it aloud, mistress, said Rob anybody. She hears her name wherever it's said, and she comes Callan. Actually, that's true, said the toad. You do not want to meet her, ever. She's bad. Worse. Just call her the queen. I, the queen, said Rob anybody. He looked at Tiffany with bright, worried eyes. Yadini can o the queen. And you the ween o granny aching, who had these hills in her bones. Yadini can the ways? She did not show ye the ways? Yeri no a hag? How can this be? Ye slammered Jenny green teeth and stared the hideless horseman in the eyes he hasni got, and you dinny ken. Tiffany gave him a brittle smile, and then whispered to the toad, who's ken? And what about his dinner? And what's a ween of granny aching? As far as I can make out, said the toad, they're amazed that you don't know about the queen and er the magical ways, what with you being a child of granny aching and standing up to the monsters. Ken means no dot. And his dinner. Forget about his dinner for now, said the toad. They thought granny aching told you her magic. Hold me up to your ear, will you? Tiffany did so, and the toad whispered, best not to disappoint them, eh? She swallowed. But she never told me about any magic she began. And stopped. It was true. Granny Aching hadn't told her about any magic. But she showed people magic every day. There was the time when the Baron's champion hound was caught killing sheep. It was a hunting dog, after all, but it had got out onto the downs and, because sheep run, it had chased. The Baron knew the penalty for sheep worrying. There were laws on the chalk, so old that no one remembered who made them, and everyone knew this one. Sheep-killing dogs were killed. But this dog was worth five hundred gold dollars, and so. The story went. The Baron sent his servant up onto the downs to Granny's hut on wheels. She was sitting on the step, smoking her pipe and watching the flocks. The man rode up on his horse and didn't bother to dismount. That was not a good thing to do if you wanted Granny Aching to be your friend. Iron shod hooves cut the turf. She didn't like that. He said. The Baron commands that you find a way to save his dog, Mistress Aching. In return, he will give you a hundred silver dollars. Granny had smiled at the horizon, puffed at her pipe for a while, and replied. A man who takes arms against his lord, that man is hanged. A starving man who steals his lord's sheep, that man is hanged. A dog that kills sheep, that dog is put to death. Those laws are on these hills and these hills are in my bones. What is a baron, that the law be break for him? She went back to staring at the sheep. The baron owns this country, said the servant. It is his law. The look Granny Aching gave him turned the man's hair white. That was the story, anyway. But all stones about Granny Aching had a bit of fairy tale about them. If it is, as ye say, his law, then let him break it and see how things may then be, she said. A few hours later the Baron sent his bailiff, who was far more important but had known Granny Aching for longer. He said. MRS Aching, the Baron requests that you use your influence to save his dog. He will happily give you fifty gold dollars to help ease this difficult situation. I am sure you can see how this will benefit everyone concerned. Granny smoked her pipe and stared at the new lambs and said. Yes speak for your master, your master speaks for his dog. 
who speaks for the hills? Where is the baron, that the law be break for him? They said that when the baron was told this he went very quiet. But although he was pompous, and often unreasonable, and far too haughty, he was not stupid. In the evening he walked up to the hut and sat down on the turf nearby. After a while, Granny Aching said. Can I help you, my lord? Granny Aching, I plead for the life of my dog, said the baron. Bring ye siller. Bring ye guilt, said Granny Aching. No silver. No gold, said the baron. Good. A law that is break by siller or guilt is no worthwhile law. And so, my lord. I plead. Granny Aching. Yet try to break the law with a word. That's right, Granny Aching. Granny Aching, the story went, stared at the sunset for a while and then said. Then be down at the little old stone barn at dawn tomorrow and we too see if an old dog can learn new tricks. There will be a reckoning. Good night to you. Most of the village was hanging around the old stone barn the next morning. Granny arrived with one of the smaller farm wagons. It held a ewe with her newborn lamb. She put them in the barn. Some of the men turned up with the dog. It was nervy and snappy having spent the night chained up in a shed, and kept trying to bite the men who were holding it by two leather straps. It was hairy. It had fangs. The baron rode up with the bailiff. Granny Aching nodded at them and opened the barn door. You're putting the dog into the barn with a sheep, M.R.S. Aching, said the bailiff. Do you want it to choke to death on lamb? This didn't get much of a laugh. No one really liked the bailiff. We shall see, said Granny. The men dragged the dog to the doorway, threw it inside the barn and slammed the door quickly. People rushed to the little windows. There was the bleeding of the lamb, a growl from the dog, and then a BAA from the lamb's mother. But this wasn't the normal BAA of a sheep. It had an edge to it. Something hit the door and it bounced on its hinges. Inside, the dog yelped. Granny Aching picked up Tiffany and held her up to a window. The shaken dog was trying to get to its feet, but it didn't manage it before the ewe charged it again, seventy pounds of enraged sheep slamming into it like a battering ram. Granny lowered Tiffany again and lit her pipe. She puffed it peacefully as the building behind her shook and the dog yelped and whimpered. After a couple of minutes she nodded at the men. They opened the door. The dog came out limping on three legs, but it hadn't managed to get more than a few feet before the ewe shot out behind it and butted it so hard that it rolled over. It lay still. Perhaps it had learned what would happen if it tried to get up again. Granny Aching had nodded to the men who grabbed the sheep and dragged it back into the barn. The baron had been watching with his mouth open. He killed a wild boar last year, he said. What did you do to him? He'll mend, said Granny Aching, carefully ignoring the question. Tis mostly his pride that's hurt. But he won't look at a sheep again, you have my thumb on that. And she licked her right thumb and held it out. After a moment's hesitation, the baron licked his thumb, reached down and pressed it against hers. Everyone knew what it meant. On the chalk, a thumb bargain was unbreakable. For you, at a word, the law was break, said Granny Aching. Will ye mind that, ye who sit in judgment? Will ye remember this day? Ye'll have cause to. The baron nodded to her. That'll do, said Granny Aching, and their thumbs parted. Next day the Baron technically did give Granny Aching gold, but it was only the gold-colored foil on an ounce of Jolly Sailor, the cheap and horrible pipe tobacco that was the only one Granny Aching would ever smoke. She was always in a bad mood if the peddlers were late and she'd run out. You couldn't bribe Granny Aching for all the gold in the world but you could definitely attract her attention with an ounce of Jolly Sailor. 
Things were a lot easier after that, the bailiff was a little less unpleasant when rents were late, the baron was a little more polite to people, and Tiffany's father said one night after two beers that the baron had been shown what happens when sheep rise up, and things might be different one day, and her mother hissed at him not to talk like that because you never knew who was listening. And, one day, Tiffany heard him telling her mother, quietly. Twas an old shepherd's trick, that's all. An old you will fight like a lion for her lamb, we all know that. That was how it worked. No magic at all. But that time it had been magic. And it didn't stop being magic just because you found out how it was done. The NAC Mac Fiegels were watching Tiffany carefully, with occasional longing glances at the bottle of special sheep liniment. I haven't even found the witch's school, she thought. I don't know a single spell. I don't even have a pointy hat. My talents are an instinct for making cheese and not running around panicking when things go wrong. Oh, and I've got a toad. And I don't understand half of what these little men are saying. But they know who's taken my brother. Somehow I don't think the Baron would have a clue how to deal with this. I don't, either, but I think I can be clueless in more sensible ways. I remember a lot of things about Granny Aching, she said. What do you want me to do? The Keldis sent us, said Rob anybody. She sensed the Quinn common. She kenned there was going to be trouble. She told us, it's gonna be bad, find the new hag who's kin to Granny Aching. She'll ken what to do. Tiffany looked at the hundreds of expectant faces. Some of the feagles had feathers in their hair, and necklaces of mole teeth. You couldn't tell someone with half his face dyed dark blue and a sword as big as he was that you weren't really a witch. You couldn't disappoint someone like that. And will you help me get my brother back, she said. The feagles' expressions didn't change. She tried again. Can you help me steal my brother back from the Quinn? Hundred of small yet ugly faces brightened up considerably. ACH, no o your Tolkien newer language, said Rob anybody. Not. Quite, said Tiffany. Can you all just wait a moment? I'll just pack some things, she said, trying to sound as if she knew what she was doing. She put the cork back on the bottle of special sheep liniment. The NAC Mac Fiegel's side. She darted back into the kitchen, found a sack, took some bandages and ointments out of the medicine box, added the bottle of special sheep liniment because her father said it always did him good and, as an afterthought, added the book Diseases of the Sheep and picked up the frying pan. Both might come in useful. The little men were nowhere to be seen when she went back into the dairy. She knew she ought to tell her parents what was happening. But it wouldn't work. It would be telling stories. Anyway, with any luck she could get Wentworth back before she was even missed. But, just in case. She kept a diary in the dairy. Cheese needed to be kept track of and she always wrote down details of the amount of butter she'd made and how much milk she'd been using. She turned to a fresh page, picked up her pencil and, with her tongue sticking out of the corner of her mouth, began to write. The NAC Mac Fiegels gradually reappeared. They didn't obviously step out from behind things, and they certainly didn't pop magically into existence. They appeared in the same way that faces appear in clouds and fires, they seemed to turn up if you just looked hard enough and wanted to see them. Audiobook generated by, Read With The Ears.